The notion of the tripods being buried in pods underground was Stevens, and I think that when you're working in a genre that's been well explored for decades, um, you just don't want to do what everybody else has done. And I think he just probably was thinking, well, they always come from space, so he just said, well, what if I go the other way? What if they come from underground? And then you work with it from there. A lot of times, a lot of your thinking starts with, what if I go the other way? I want to show, um, I want to show you this interesting thing. Well, Stephen definitely had a few things in mind when he came to me uh, with, with the brief, and it was, uh, you know, the three legs, definitely, that it has to be a tripod, and it has to be able to do certain things. There were certain things in the script, and most importantly, first, was to look scary. I wanted the tripods, number one, to be really scary, because they're going to represent what's driving them. And so I wanted the tripods themselves, I wanted the audience to say, okay, okay, it's just a machine, let's get to what's inside, let's see the aliens. I wanted the audience to actually be terrified by what these things look like from the outside. So I had the most amazing group of computer graphic artists working on the design of the tripods. And we went back and researched all of the wealth of design interpretations that have been done today. And part of it was to be conscious of what had been done, but also to steer away from that because we wanted to create something new and unique. And one of the great things that Stephen wanted to do was to create something that was iconic, but yet still paid homage and tribute to the original story. And so the whole idea of three-legged was, was wonderful because then you had to start thinking about, well, why did they make it three-legged? You know? And so we had to think about different biology, different physiology of why they would perhaps make it like that because obviously for us we're sort of bipeds and quadrupeds and then once you kind of do that homework then it's really a matter of designing something aesthetically pleasing that looks and addresses sort of what the story needs are and so in some ways you know working closely with ILM we would do some design they would do some designs it would dovetail together Stephen would basically give us feedback on what works and what doesn't and then we'd go back and we would do our own interpretation and it just kept going and going and being refined the original ideas that we had discussed about was that the tripods were pretty much mechanical and they are mechanical uh, they're not a living thing at all. But as we got into it, started animating them and looking at them, they become a little more lifelike in their movements. I remember seeing the designs of the tripod and going, wow, looks like a Sherman tank atop these you know, long, spindly flowing legs. And picturing it in movement, these legs in a graceful flow, is, it's almost like watching a giraffe and you're not realizing how much ground it's actually covering because you're hypnotized by this wonderful motion. And then contrast that with, you know, it could be lethal at the drop of a hat you know, with the tentacles and everything. So I thought it was a wonderful character in that sense. The lights coming off of it, the size certainly was all from the book. And we just took it there as a starting point and really made it able to act and react with its environment and with the human actors, basically. The tripods had three legs, and so threes are a guideline for how we were designing most of the things. So there were like three eyes, three limbs, three fingers, and the aliens, of course, were three-limbed or just some odd, you know, configuration. And it, it really made it compelling because just the fact that you have three legs dictated a different kind of movement and a different kind of form. So the, the tripods in, in themselves, I think, were become very iconic in terms of what the aliens are. Just the fact that there are three symbolizes the difference between our culture and theirs. It has a kind of terrestrial buoyancy in the sense that it is walking on the earth and there are laws of gravity, but yet it has this kind of flow to it that is essentially aquatic. And there's a lot of aquatic characteristics of the tripod, such as it's almost like a jellyfish atop the long legs underneath. It has the tentacles of like a squid or an octopus. So all these things, again, it, it's on the land, but it has aquatic characteristics. Stephen kept saying, these things move like really scary ballet dancers. It's so interesting, like you don't normally think of a monster moving like a ballet dancer, and that dichotomy gave me something to push off of and kind of, you know, shape the way the design went. What we did is we took the animatic model and we started doing some development. This is sort of putting the tripod through its paces, deciding what the range of motion would be, and really finding sort of the bookends for what Stephen was looking for. And you can see on the legs, we really had to decide how bendy they would be, you know, what started to look almost too animated and not heavy enough. The next step is then to rig the character. And what you see here is all of these colored controllers. The animators will move over time to animate 
The animation on this is pretty important to give a sense of sort of amazement and danger and humbleness to these creatures. Like there's nothing you can do, they're there, they're in control. You know, that's pretty neat that that comes across in the film and Randy's been really good at getting that in the animation and all. Yeah, this is actually the walk that Stephen really liked. He felt that there was a sense of weight and heaviness to this and also a nice organic sort of fluid motion to it. We did go a little more towards creature-like look. You know, the birds, that was an idea that I heard from Stephen, which I thought was wonderful, that there was, you know, that all these birds kind of were following these war machines because they symbolized death and they were creating death. And so these black birds were almost like vultures, scavengers, and so they foreshadowed the images of death. And I thought it was a wonderful way of doing all of that, but yet still getting a sense of drama because you don't know if these birds are going to the danger or away from danger and whether you should follow or run away. And it was just great because in an image, it, it sort of, strikes fear in you without really knowing why, but you're reacting to it. Look at the goddamn birds! machines actually die in the movie is one of those iconic images that I grew up with you know I love seeing those things and I think it's one of those wonderful images because it reinforces that you don't have to change our reality much to make it fantastic and by introducing these gigantic war machines half crashed into a building kind of automatically gives you a very stunning icon and so you know there are many ways to do it and of course you know I think it's always best to go with the simplest which is to have the machine there and then just you know treat it with real careful lighting real careful staging so it, it becomes a very surreal moment where you're seeing this very horrific thing but yet it was an image that gave hope uh, hope for humanity when we first started developing ET it was a much edgier darker story that we were telling and it actually evolved into something that was more benign well Martians is not mentioned in my film because my aliens don't come from Mars our aliens come probably from as far away as E.T. came from, except they came from a darker part, a darker part of the universe, whereas E.T. came from a rather benevolent planet. The aliens have gone rogue, you know? <laughs> They're rogue alien. It's E.T., man, but he's gone bad, you know? E.T.'s gone bad, he's rogue. You know, I don't try to psychoanalyze what is on the aliens' minds, except that their, their bent on our total extermination. They just want to eliminate us from existence and they probably have plans for our planet themselves. But we don't go into what's their motivation. Uh, we just basically experience the result of these nefarious plans to supplant us with themselves. They're malevolent. You do not want to run into these aliens. We must have had 20, 30 designs on aliens from the sublime to the ridiculous. You know, Stephen said that, you know, these aliens grew up perhaps in the zero-G environment, so there's really no up and down. But yet we had to make them so that they looked intelligent. They're not just beasts. They were these rangy designs that I felt kind of had amphibian characteristics because there was a slight sheen or wetness to the skin. This is one of the uh, first reference images that we had, and we all kind of got together. Uh, to discuss around this piece. You can see the reflective eyes inside there. This is when we got our kind of first glimpse at how alien this alien was really going to be. You can notice it's got an extra joint in the arms, three legs as expected, these um, odd little flippers that are there, vestigial limbs, something like that. And uh, we all just kind of went from there, got together, and discussed what it was going to be. And so this is the first turntable sculpt that we did. The model is done by Frank Gravatt and this is to match the uh, reference photos 
but this was where Frank took it, and it's just a really wonderful sculpt. And the way that I saw them moving was almost like a tree frog w when it walks, not when it's jumping, but when it walks, it has this kind of gait where it, it, it's always kind of in contact with the ground and it was kind of stealthy. So it was almost a cross between a, a frog and the stealth of a cat. And so when the aliens were moving, we tried to keep it very creepy and eerie, coming in and out of pools of light and using their hands like to place on the wall to go through spaces. And as you see one hand touch the wall, you see the other hand, and then there's a surprise, the third leg comes through. So it's always kind of, again, revealing things about these creatures. You don't get it all at once. For that, we spoke with Randy and with Dennis, and we went over a number of behaviors and things like that, looking at it saying, okay, is it more reptilian? Is it more human-like? Things like that. And what we came upon was it's primarily reptilian influence, so it moves in a very lithe, kind of slow but precise fashion. And uh, we were very sure to push that it's curious. That was the main drive behind it, is whenever it moved and behaved, it was always going to be looking and curious. And these are uh, some early facial sculpt tests that Frank did. So this is the character looking left and right. And then here are a number of the facial expressions. So we started out just going through a large variety of it. There's a shot where it has to uh, lick a photograph and another shot where it's drinking from some water. So we were very sure that we needed to have a good, interesting tongue shape, recognizable, but at the same time still very alien. As you can also see, the eyes kind of bulge a little bit. So this is part of where we were giving a lot of different variety and opportunity to the, uh, to the animators and to really drive the personality of it there. In the cellar sequence with the aliens, there was a uh, full-size styrofoam carved uh, stand-in for the alien, which we use after a shot was done. We run it through the paces with the same camera setup and lights so that we would have that reference for lighting and TDing the eventual animation. The statue, the Minuteman statue, was a real key image. You know, Stephen really wanted to show, you know, how this alien weed and this aliens have sort of encompassed everything. You know, all of our images, all of our icons, and so that was a, a key moment where you actually saw something very familiar enveloped in this, and it was very symbolic of what the aliens were trying to do. And so it was an important image to try to get because, you know, even though it's kind of played in the background, you know, you understand what happened. It's quite extraordinary when you consider the era that H.G. was writing the original story, for him to come up with the solution of it being the common cold that kills off the alien invasion. Here's a thing which, if science could, it would eliminate the common cold. And what Wells is saying by using that as the, you know, the ultimate denouement is everything in our world, all of the environment is related and every part of it is necessary. So if we had managed to kill off the common cold, well, the aliens would have killed us. And for someone to have written that back at the end of the 19th century is, is quite extraordinarily prescient. Despite all of man's technology and all of our courage and all of our hopefulness, what really saves us in the end are the most microscopic creatures alive on this planet today. And that was something I didn't want to lose. The, the idea of bacteria destroying them when all our weapons failed is just a, a great irony. That which we take lightly and attempt to stamp out and never even think about and can't even see is much more powerful than our greatest weaponry. And the idea that nature in some way knows a hell of a lot more than we do, I think is an idea that will last forever. <laughs>